May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his. And anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and free from economic hardship and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. Today, uh, we have uh, three more pieces from a work in progress Tassahara Stories. So I'm going to start reading that just as soon as we've had our pause to meditate. So when you hear the bell, hit pause, if you wish, and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish, and when you're ready to come back, hit unpause, and we will be here ready to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever. And we'll get right into the next pieces from Tatsuhara Stories. Frances Thompson had read the Bhagavad Gita and Alan Watts. She knew she'd have to study Zen, though she didn't know why. She was born in Japan in the 30s and thought she'd have to do it there. That was in the late 50s and early 60s, before there was much talk of all this except in hip circles. She went to San Francisco from Southern California with a guy who had friends on Bush Street. Francis recalls, We went to hear a lecture by Suzuki Roshi, and so I stayed to fulfill a life yearning rather than Suzuki Roshi being the main reason. I never thought of him as my teacher. Some people will say that the way he handled a teacup transformed their life, but not me. <laughs> he did teach us how to handle objects differently, though. <laughs> Tatsuhara was so intense with lots of characters and liveliness. It stayed with me more than other things I've done in my life. It's a lot more sane there now. <laughs> Stuff we used to fight and quibble over is all figured out. It's more mellow now, but it was always too vague for me, and the just sitting can be a killer. I was harder to be with back then at Tassahara. We all thought our opinions were real, <laughs> and we were warring all the time. People integrate it better now, and there's a beautifully serene quality to a lot of people who've sat and practiced a long time. Like 
Catherine Thanis. Francis appreciated the opportunity to meet all the teachers who passed through there. She found Zen lacking, though, and said there was too much shikantaza, just sitting. But it was the only thing to do at the time. But it was the only thing to do at the time, she said. We had to walk up and down the Zendo at Tassahara and bow a lot. It changed how I am in the world. It's a different way of being in the world, being silent with others in the Zendo, at meals, in the baths. That sort of thing is missing from our culture. Suzuki Roshi was amazing in that that happened. He was a little quiet man that everyone said they didn't know so well. He didn't set himself up so high. How did he remain so low-key? He seemed to do nothing, and so much happened around him. I appreciate him more now. That guy really knew what he was doing. He really was teaching us all the time. And we didn't know it. Creek. Their laughter was a frequent ingredient of the Tassahara scene. Mainly, they were doing what was expected, but sometimes they'd stray from the tracks. And even in Zazen, their jubilant voices would occasionally filter in from afar, climbing in a hill or naked in the creek. Diane and her friend Margaret had been so naughty together that fall that they were asked to skip the next practice period that ran for 90 days from January to mid-April. Dan Welsh had taken Diane for a walk and told her, and she cried. I was not pleased when I learned I wanted Diane there. It was exactly the same decision that had come down on Bob and me the year before with what seemed to me to be the same ridiculous logic. Except in time, I learned it wasn't logic. It was Suzuki's soft heart. He didn't want to separate Bob and me or Diane and Margaret because we were so close. That was ridiculous. Why not send one to the city and leave one at Tassahara? I got a letter from Diane. She and Margaret had hung out together for a while in the city, and Margaret had gone to Maryland to be with relatives. Diane was lonely. Then, about three days into the practice period, she showed up. People were surprised. I was worried she'd just come in on her own, but nope. Peter knew she was coming. Silas had called. I didn't have a chance to talk to her till after evening zazen. We went to our favorite tryst spot, if Suzuki wasn't there. <laughs> His cabin. We talked and talked. Poor thing, she had to do Tongario the next day. We weren't asleep when the wake-up bell rang. Mm. Absence made our heart so fond she had a difficult, groggy day and fasted so she'd not be so sleepy. I just would have slept while sitting on the Zafu, but that's not so comfortable for a lot of people. Sorry, I said to her that night when it was over. She didn't respond, just trudged to her room and sleeping bag on futon. How she ended up back at Tassahara is that she'd gone to see Suzuki. He'd asked how she was doing. She said she was very unhappy and missed Margaret and hated the city and wanted to go to Tassahara 
that the problem had been her and Margaret together. She's on the East Coast, so why can't I go back? Suzuki asked her, Why do you want to go to Tassajara? Her answer, Because I've never seen the creek in the winter. <laughs> that was good enough for him. The best thing is to give an animal lots of room, he said. So I'll do the same for you. <laughs> Roshi's. Les K was a student at the Los Altos Haiku Zendo. He was a career IBM employee in the doomed punch card division. Unlike most students at Tassajara, he had a family and could afford to bring them all there as guests. He also had a nice new comfy car. They were there for a week in July of 1968 when Peter asked him if Tassajara could borrow his car to help pick up some Zen dignitaries. There were more than would fit in just the Land Rover. Later that day they arrived, Hakuun Yasutani and Soen Nakagawa, Yasutani's student, Robert Aitken of the Diamond Sangha in Hawaii, Soen's disciple, Taisan, who was teaching in New York and Maizumi from L.A. Also accompanying them were Taisan student Lali Rasset, Yastani's Zen priest's son, and Flora Cortua, the author of An Experience of Enlightenment, which Yastani had asked her to write. A focal point of the visit was to honor Nyogen Sinzaki, the first Zen priest to stay and teach in America. Sinzaki had been left in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco in 1905 by his teacher, Soen Shaku, who'd been invited there to lecture. Shaku told him, just face the great city and see whether it conquers you or you conquer it. Sinzaki did menial jobs, hung out in the library, lectured and started the floating Zendo, which for some time was just down Bush Street from Sogoji. He floated down to L.A. after the war, which Sinzaki spent in Wyoming at an internment camp. He died in 1958. Sinzaki avoided titles, fame, and wealth. He's known for his teaching to, quote, put no head above your head, and his supposed last words, remember the Dharma, remember the Dharma, remember the Dharma. Charles Gooding, president of the L.A. Bosatsukai, of former Sinzaki students, came along as well. Sinzaki had become close with Soen as a result of reading his poetry. He was Robert Aiken's first teacher, and Maizumi had sat with him in L.A. The only person in the ZC who'd sat with him was Claude Dallenberg, who revered him. Among the group, only Maizumi had been to Tassajara before. The others were curious to see the new Zen monastery, just over a year old, especially because they had students who wanted to go there. Almost no teachers liked to see their students go elsewhere to study, even for a short time. They might not come back. Yasutani and Soen were Roshis, and we were all excited to have them there. The other priests 
were called sensei, and we knew they'd be Roshis too someday. To us, the title Roshi conferred the zenith of what could be accomplished in human form. Lolly Rossett laughed when I said, Hey guys, let's go over there and get some Roshi vibes. <laughs> Yasutani was in his early 80s and had been leading Sashin in the States for six years. A number of Tassajara students had done Sashin with him. Among them were Bob Halpern, Jeff Broadbent, Claude Dallenberg, who'd sat a few in Kamakura, and David Stendelrest, the East Coast Benedictine monk not new to Zen practice. Yatsutani was in a Soto lineage that acted more like what we thought of as Rinzai. In a lecture, he said that Soto's founder, Dogen, had studied koans for 15 years with Esai, the founder of Japanese Rinzai, before going to China where he attained great enlightenment practicing Shikantaza, just sitting. Yatsutani said Dogen's koan study was essential to his awakening. Using an analogy from Shakyamuni, he said that an archer hits the bullseye after a hundred tries due to his effort with the first 99. He said that belief in reincarnation is a requirement of Buddhism and that Buddha was born enlightened. Quite a contrast to Shunyu Suzuki's approach. Lolly, Brother David, and I rode in the back of a pickup going up the Tatsuhara Road. Bumping along with us was Taisan, teacher of Zen studies in New York City. Naturally, I took advantage of the situation to ask him penetrating Dharma questions, none of which I recall, but I do remember a response of his which was, there are only two types of people, those who know and those who don't know. Hmm, cut and dry, unlike what I was used to. He seemed very sure of himself, but wasn't acting haughty. We pulled in next to other vehicles at a turnout about four miles up where the ridge begins and walked out to the highest point visible from Tatsuhara. Sinzaki had designated Soen as the teacher to carry on his work in America. Soen had conducted Sinzaki's funeral in L.A. in 1958 and was traveling with a portion of the ashes, which he'd been keeping at his temple, Ryutakuji, in Shizuoka Prefecture near Suzuki's Rinsoin. He'd set the ashes on the Tasara altar for the visit and brought a pinch for scattering at our moon viewing. As the sun disappeared behind mountains to the west, the top of the full moon appeared from the east, and so in, intoned the opening of the Heart Sutra, Makahanya Haramita Shingyo, which we chanted while watching the whole bright orb appear. He led us into another recitation of the Heart Sutra, then to some other familiar chants, all the while leading us in clapping to the rhythm of the words. Then he called out, May we all exist in unity. And we followed him doing that till, he suggested, we form our own moon. And we joined hands and danced around in a circle. At this point, he started improvising shouts at the moon and others followed. He called out, this is true hippie dance. May Tassahara help all sentient beings to achieve peace. We got back to Tassahara at bedtime. I had no interest in going to bed and went to the baths. After they were closed to guests at Tim, the kerosene lamps had been extinguished, but there was plenty of light from the full moon. 
I was enjoying the indoor open-faced plunge when the silhouette of another late-night bather appeared and descended the steps. It was so in. He was talkative, playful, showed him how to leap into the plunge from the handrail, <laughs> went to the steam room where we chatted in the pitch dark. Every spring, as the creek subsided, we'd build a little dam outside the steam rooms so that there'd be plenty of cool creek water to dip into after the hot plunge and steam. There was a large old sycamore which was half-rooted in the creek. I showed Suen how we could duck down and come back up inside a hollow the roots and trunk created. Slivers of light danced in. He just loved it. The guy was like an excited kid, so I suggested we go down creek. No need to get dressed. <laughs> as long as we stay in the creek, we can get by the Tassara cabins naked. Hopped rocks, swam pools, once beyond civilization, walked barefoot on paths and crossed creek twice to arrive at the narrows, smooth granite contours, magnificent in the moonlight. There we meditated, chanted, and jumped off the side into the deep pool. We walked down creek further to the place where sheer granite walls bank a pool. We floated, looked up at the moon and stars, stood in hip high water, so and clapped his hands, which produced bouncing echoes. I joined in, making loud popping sounds by cupping my hands and clapping them hard before a puckered mouth. This delighted Son, who tried in vain to do the same. The next morning, Son gave a talk in the Zindo, in which he told about getting a student to help him find a used bar of soap so he wouldn't have to open the paper-wrapped one in his room. When I was young, I thought Americans were fortunate to take drink from paper cups and throw it away, he said. Now I think it is a shame. He spoke about our evening together in the creek and bade me stand and demonstrate that popping sound, an exposure I didn't cherish and which brought on mild but amused scolding later in the day from Baker. During that lecture, there were tremors shaking the zendo, rattling the kerosene glass lamps mounted along the walls. So in took that as a sign of the significance of our gathering. Lolly Rossett knew So in well. She'd been Tyson's student, secretary, and advisor since soon after he arrived in New York City. She told him she wanted to go to a practice period at Tassahara and said he put up an anonymous sign quoting some Zen teaching that said the teaching is everywhere and you don't have to go all over to study. But she definitely wanted to go to Tassahara and also to see the Zen Center in San Francisco. They didn't talk about it further, but he knew he couldn't stop her and she knew he didn't like it because she said they always knew what the other was thinking. So he suggested she come with him to L.A., where he was joining his teacher, Soen, and Yasutani, who were coming from a session in Hawaii. Maybe then they'd go check out Tassahara together. Everyone else was interested, and the visit was quickly arranged. And it was all because I insisted on going there, she said. It sort of snowballed. As Lolly was one of the visiting guests, she met Suzuki in his cabin with Taisan and a few others. You have a big nose, Suzuki said to her. <laughs> she didn't feel insulted, but said she was very impressed by him because he was so simple, unneurotic, a little shy. 
and so unlike most people, I immediately felt good with him. I couldn't help it, like most people. There was just something about him, his ordinariness, and a mixture of great clarity and intelligence, and a little bit of Dennis the Menace humor in one of his eyes, the way the one eyebrow raised. She'd been close with Tyson's wife as well and never noticed anything improper before that trip. I was totally innocent about his thing with women. She got the first inkling when friends of his in L.A. didn't want to put them both up. At Tassahara a few days later, something happened that made it pretty clear. Someone mm, came with a flashlight. Lolly, born Hannelore Eckhart, having been brought up in a cultured German home, was proper and didn't go in to detail. Proper, yet not prudish or naive. She might have been when she was a Hitler youth, something she didn't advertise, but her trail led to newspaper work in Paris, where she eventually got involved with the French underground. As things were falling apart, she re-entered Germany and almost got killed by a drunk SS officer who pulled a gun on her and accused her of treason. A couple of customs agents stopped him and got her on a bus. After the war, she lived in South Germany with her lesbian aunt and partner and mainly tried not to starve. I think the Japanese who went through the war, she said, I think like the Japanese who went through the war, she said, we had a different context than the Americans. I've always been philosophically oriented, but not because of the war only. My grandfather was a Buddhist intellectual professor. He was the head of the University of Cologne, which he founded with Adenauer. The Nazis put him out of business because of his international connections. She'd been in the center of New York's avant-garde society, married to Barney Rossett, founder of Evergreen Review and, Gro and Grove Press, where Baker had worked. Barney Rossett won important freedom of speech cases, publishing Lady Chatterley's Lover, Tropic of Cancer, Howl, and much more. He also bought and distributed the most sexually explicit movie to date, the Swedish art film I Am Curious Yellow, which I would see the following year in Monterey amidst a hooting audience of soldiers. Maybe that flashlight in the night she referred to had something to do with Bonnie, who... Soon after the visit was Tyson's attendant for a session where he translated for Yasutani. She came back reporting that she loved the session. She said that Yasutani gave constant interviews, which she overheard. She told about some she remembered. A student asked if keeping up with the news would make him more deluded, and that Tyson answered for Yasutani, saying, you're so deluded that it really doesn't matter. <laughs> she also said she and Tyson slept together every night. As we stood on the road, Hanson Gachot, watching our esteemed visitors stand for a final photo, Kobun pointed to Yasutani. Good example of great Rinsai Roshi, he said even though Yasutani was Soto. Then he nodded toward Suzuki. And Suzuki Roshi is a good example of a great Soto Roshi. I asked, what about Soen? And he said, mm, too much personality. Lolly went back to New York with Tyson as planned. She would be busy helping to prepare for the September 15th installation of the Zen Studies Society's new sendo at which Soen presided. 
Suzuki didn't go, but sent a heavy Tassahara Creek stone by air freight in his stead. Soen gave Tyson transmission during that visit, and after that he was known as Edo Shimano Roshi. Talking about those three teachers, Lolly said, Suzuki Roshi was different in that he'd do something like clean. Edo she would never clean. He'd have others do that, and Soen wouldn't either. Not because he considered it below him, but because he was always in the clouds <laughs> and more into the universal than the particular. But he was very adventurous. When he heard that I'd traveled all over the U.S. with two kids and a dog and a tent and a boat, and that we camped in the mountains with bears, he got very excited and organized the whole Zendo to go camping. That was the kind of thing he did, more dramatic. I liked that too, but I felt at ease with Suzuki Roshi. There was no need to say anything. I had a little altar in the living room with the window behind it revealing the city and the sky. And Soen Roshi was a great one for nonconformity. He always had new ideas to shake things up. He found a couple of huge mushrooms on his camping trip and put them to the right and left, showing the inside to the Buddha. I enjoyed Soen, and he made all kinds of hocus-pocus, and it was interesting, but kind of a little bit weird. Mm, too dramatic. Two weeks or so later, Suzuki Roshi was staying at my place, and I was telling all about sewing and the camping and the mushrooms, and I was sort of full of it. And the next morning at Zazen, we always did Zazen in front of the Buddha. I came in, and Suzuki Roshi had turned the mushrooms the other way around, and I never said a word because I knew he meant don't get hung up on what he or I say. And the next day, I put them the other way around to show him I knew it didn't matter. <laughs> Suzuki had a chronic cough the last couple of years of his life, and this didn't go unnoticed by Lolly. The poor man had been coughing like crazy, and whenever he had these attacks of coughs, I'd call San Francisco and tell them he was seriously ill. And to take him to a doctor. I'd tell him to lie down, and, and I babied him a little bit. Suzuki's doctor couldn't find anything wrong with him that would be a cause for coughing, he told us in a lecture, adding that his doctor suggested it might be the result of nervousness. <laughs> Years later, I visited with Edo Shimano at the Dai Bosatsu Monastery near Woodstock in New York. He seemed to have softened with age. Either that or he hid the person who, back in the late 60s, had told someone over the phone, don't bother to come if you can't sit full lotus. <laughs> he remembered fondly the visit to Tassahara and Suzuki. He also remembered Dan Welsh and Dan's Quaker parents, whom he said meditated, but not in a Zen way. He said that he'd always been an arrogant person and that Suzuki's total humility had so impressed him. He was very natural. He put formality aside. That was impressive because I was brought up in the Rinzai establishment where formality was very important especially in Japanese Rinzai Zen, and coming here to America and meeting Suzuki Roshi, he gave me a natural, warm welcome without formality. One thing that surprised and somewhat bothered me is that Edo said he'd visited Suzuki in the city before the trip to Tassahara and asked him about a woman student of his who'd applied to go to Tassahara and received no answer. Suzuki just said he let the students take care of everything, so she didn't get in. I told Aino that her application was probably just lost, and she should have tried again. We were accepting everyone back then. He said he'd tell her because she really felt bad about that. So 30 years later, she was going to hear that I said she shouldn't have given up. 
hadn't been rejected, or in that unlikely case, it would have been communicated. I said, she's welcome to reapply. Edo visited Suzuki a couple of months before Suzuki died. Suzuki Roshi's talk with me was unforgettable. First, he said, in a very comfortable way, with equanimity and tranquility, Cancer and I are now good friends. Also, he brought up the famous Zen koan when the head monk uh, asked an ill Basso how he was, and Basso's answer was Sun Face Buddha, Moon Face Buddha. Our talk was amazingly enough not at all serious. Death was approaching. He knew he would die. We knew he would die. But despite all the intense sadness, he was almost cheerful. I can't understand it. <laughs> it really meant something to me. It really surprised me. That was a big comfort to me in those days. Then about an hour later, someone knocked at the door, and Dick Baker came in with two or three others, the way he looked at Dick Baker. Ah, that perhaps is called compassion. There was love and compassion when he looked at Dick. He didn't say anything, just the way he looked at him, his face and eyes. I thought, my goodness, this is called compassion. At Baker's request, Edo gave a talk in the Buddha Hall that evening. The subject was Sun Face Buddha, Moon Face Buddha, Buddha feeling good, Buddha in pain. When he returned to New York, he spoke of Suzuki's profound effect upon him in a lecture, saying, He is a true Roshi. I learned a great deal from Suzuki Roshi. So in that sense, I consider Suzuki Roshi not only as one of the great patriarchs of Zen in America, but also I consider myself as one of his hidden students. Nothing was drastic, so penetrating, so gentle, like soft spring rain penetrates into the earth, saturating it. That's how I see his teaching style, soft, gentle spring rain. So that's this week's pieces <laughs> from Tassahara Stories. You know, uh, when uh, I wrote about Lolly and Edo, and it's years later, that'll all be uh, my plan for it, is to move everything like that uh, to the end of the book, like where are they now? What, what happened later? It's not where are they now. <laughs> They're not with us anymore. A lot of these people. Um, I know. I keep noticing that. Uh, you know how I see it? I see it as a game of musical chairs. Mm, maybe game is not the right word. But uh, I see it like musical chairs. We keep going around the circle, and then the bell rings, and we take a chair, and we sit down. And then, oh, look, my friend there, they don't have a chair. Oh, they're gone now. And then we go around, and then the bell rings, and then, huh, there's no chair for me. What happens now? Thanks for joining us. And before we sign off, uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to our sponsor, which is you, dear listener. And if you'd like to 
make a contribution so we can keep going, uh, just go to cuke.com, C-U-K-E.com, and hit the donate link. You go to the donate page, it shows you how to send a check or make a PayPal donation or become a PayPal subscriber for as little as $1 a month. And we would really appreciate it. Because, like all living things, we want to keep living, (laughs) so to speak. Thank you very much. This has been a Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Doggy Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear, lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you, and yours, and all of us, a grand awakening. <laughs>